When you first get started in astrophotography, it can be a little bit challenging getting the right combination of gear for your intended style. Or maybe you already have something, but you want to upgrade to a different telescope, and you're not quite sure what you're able to get with that new field of view. And the thing about it is different combinations of gear produce different results. In this video, I'm going to give examples of what is visible with an ASPC-sized camera sensor and different focal lengths using Stellarium. And I'm also going to be giving examples of common lenses and telescopes. That way you kind of know what is being used for each example. Now before we get going, there are a couple caveats. And the first one is, please note that a different camera chip size will produce a different result. A full frame or a four thirds sensor will look different. So if you have either one of those, then it may look a little bit different than what I'm showing you. And also if you have a small planetary camera, that'll really take the field of view in a lot. There are also many things like focal reducers and field flatteners that might change the field a small amount. For some objects, using a large focal length can get you some detail, but using a smaller focal length for a wider shot can show you some of the cool stuff around that object. And to save a little bit of time, instead of listing every single common focal length, I'm just going to give a range of focal lengths, but this should help give you a good general idea of what you can see at each focal length range. So let's dive into the first one, which is 8 to 24 millimeters. At 8 to 24 millimeters, this is where you go for Milky Way shots. This is where you can include landscape with the picture and get that nice, beautiful galaxy core. And looking at Stellarium, you can see that this is with the Canon T7i and the 14 millimeter. The camera I will be showing for each shot in this will be the Canon T7i, which is an ASPC size sensor. One thing to note about this focal length is that tracking is not necessary. However, it is kind of encouraged just so you pull out a little bit more detail in the image. An example lens for this range is the common Rokinon or Samyang 14 millimeter lens. This one's very popular in the astrophotography community for Milky Way shots. But if all you have is your 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, you can use that too. And the next range we are going is 35 to 85 millimeters. So do you have a favorite constellation or asterism? This is the perfect focal length range to do it with. It's wide enough to capture most constellations and asterisms in the frame. However, there are a couple of exceptions such as Draco, which you want to use, say, 18 millimeters for. But for the most part, you can capture a lot of constellations in this range. And here is where you're going to want to start using star trackers just to keep the stars sharp. You're not going to need a whole long time of tracking, but it will help. And the example lens in this range is the very common Nifty 50. It's a cheap little 50 millimeter lens that is very common for most brands of cameras. So you pretty much can find it anywhere. So for example, if you wanted to get, say, the teapot, and get some of the Milky Way core near the Lagoon Nebula, with the 50 millimeter lens, this is a great choice. Moving into the next range, we're going to 85 to 300 millimeters. And the reason I mention this is because commonly kit lenses that have a zoom lens come with sometimes a 70 to 300. And this is where we start moving into the large deep sky objects, things such as the Carina Nebula, which I'm showing here. But you can also get things like the entire Veil Nebula complex and Roa Fuki, which I took up at Cherry Springs a couple weeks ago using this exact combination that I was showing in Stellarium. The Rokinon 135 millimeter lens is probably the most common in this range. However, this is where we move into smaller telescopes such as the Red Cat. Now the Red Cat will have a little bit more focal length and you'll be a little bit more more zoomed in like you're seeing here with the Veil Nebula, but it's still plenty wide enough for large objects. And like I said, don't worry, if you have that 70 to 300 kit lens, don't fret. You can still get a great image with it. Keep in mind that the higher in focal length you go, you're going to start getting the need for some guiding. So moving into the next range, we are going to 300 to 450 millimeters. Now this is a very common range for starting with telescopes and sticking with them. And the reason that we're starting with telescopes and sticking with them is because buying a camera lens at the same exact focal length is way pricier. And the telescope is built for what we're doing, so this is a benefit here. But from this focal length forward, you're definitely going to need guiding to keep your stars sharp. And some common telescopes in this range are the William Optics Zenith Star 61 and the 71 for that matter, the Radian Raptor, and the Skywatcher Spirit 80 ED. Those are all very common telescopes for this range. Some common objects include the North American Nebula, and you can start getting some detail with Andromeda. Along with the Pleiades, this is where you can start pulling out some of the dust in the nebulosity itself. And for my southern friends, this is where you can start getting a nice view of the Tarantula Nebula. And one thing to note about this focal length too is that moonshots that you use to capture the entire moon disk with some details start to become possible in this range 
is kind of cool. So before we continue, I do have a question for you. What focal length are you shooting at? Let me know down in the comments below. The next range I am listing is 450 to 700 millimeter. Now this is generally a step up from the previous tier as you wanna just get just a little bit deeper. This is where 100 millimeter refractors are pretty common. And it should go without saying that guiding is necessary here. A couple common telescopes in this range is the Skywatcher a Spirit 100 and the William Optics Xenostar 81. Now for some examples of objects with this focal length in an APS-C size camera is the Lobster Nebula, the Eagle Nebula. For my friends in the Southern Hemisphere, the Running Chicken Nebula is great at this focal length. And looking at a different time of year, this is where you start pulling out some detail in the Christmas tree cluster or the cone nebula, whichever one you like to call it. So the next range here is gonna be much larger and this is starting to get away from focal lengths that I recommend to beginners, purely because going with a smaller focal length when you first start, it's a little bit more forgiving in case something is a little bit off. But I'm still gonna give you some examples. And this is generally where people start to switch away from refractors and in the Schmidt Cassegrain style telescopes or Rasas because this helps them save some costs. There is something to be aware of though, if you start moving into the Schmidt Cassegrains. Say for example, you buy the Nexstar 6SE, which I will be using for this example in Stellarium. It comes with a mount that's not that great for astrophotography. So you're gonna wanna buy just the tube itself and use your own equatorial mount because it will cause some rotation in your image and it's just not gonna be turn out very well. But like I said, the example here is the Celestron Nexstar 6SE. A good example is starting to get some detail on the Crescent Nebula. And if you wanna use the 1500 millimeter of this telescope, going for the Hercules cluster is great. And of course, for my friends in the South, using the Nexstar 6SE is great for the Wishing Well cluster as well. Now, if you're not going for something like that next star 6SE. Another common telescope is the Skywatcher Spirit 120 and that has an 840 millimeter range. At this range, this is where full disc shots of the moon start to fill out the frame pretty well. Anything higher and you're gonna start to need to do a mosaic. But if you look right here, this is exactly how the moon looks at 840 millimeters with an APS-C size sensor. So for our last range here, we are going with 2000 plus. This is pretty much all Schmidt Cassegrains when it comes to the purposes of astrophotography. There are a couple other styles of telescope, but they're not as common, but this is pretty much what you're going to see out there. But this is where you start to go real deep and look for those small objects that are small. Well, from our perspective, anyway, they're still quite large, but they're tiny to us. So quickly for examples, objects like the sunflower galaxy or small cluster like M19, or say for example, at this focal length, you wanted to split up the Leo triplet and get each galaxy individually this is something that you can do but you're also going to need a large guide scope to keep things accurate now these focal lengths are also great for getting in on the planets this is what you'd want to use to image a planet however there is a caveat you don't want to use an APS-C size sensor because well, this is what it would look like with the Edge HD 14 and the Canon T7i. You would actually need to use any one of Zewo's planetary cameras. For telescopes, you're pretty much gonna see, like I said, Schmidt Cassegrain. You're gonna see Celestron Edge HDs a lot in this range and it's pretty much the most common one. But that's it, I hope this gave you a good example of what is visible at each focal length, and it kinda helps guide your decisions if you're getting started. If you found this video helpful, please do like, comment, and then maybe consider subscribing. I wanna thank you for watching, clear skies.